Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to the center of the earth. In this retelling of the classic novel by Jules Verne, we will travel across the stunning beauty of Iceland's summer landscape. We will meander through a volcano to uncover the wild and wonderful worlds that exist beneath the earth. We will sail across a subterranean sea, all while encountering the unbelievable prehistoric creatures that can be found there. On our journey, we will be alongside Professor Otto Liedenbrock, enthusiastic scientist, his nephew, the mild-mannered Axel, and their guide, an Icelandic Ederduck hunter. We will be in good hands as we descend into the earth to uncover the secrets that lie there. But, Before we begin our journey to the center of the earth, let us take a moment to relax and find comfort in the place that we are in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Here and now, there are no obligations. There are no responsibilities. By simply closing your eyes and listening to the sound of my voice, you are already nourishing your body and mind and giving them much needed rest. There is nothing more you need to do. What you are seeking will come in time. For a moment, Let us imagine that you are still in your comfortable bed. But your bed is somewhere else entirely. You are on an island off the coast of the beautiful country of Iceland. Around you, the waves are a deep, dark blue. The color of the sky on a cloudless evening, just as the sun is setting. There are white caps on the ocean, rise and fall. And around you, the island is one of the most stunning, otherworldly things that you have ever seen. The beach that is mere feet from the end of your bed is not a beach of golden sand that has been kissed by the sun. It is silky dark sand with tiny stones that glisten in the evening sun that is still peeking through the white fluffy clouds overhead, contrasted with the dark blue water. The black sand makes you feel as though you are in a dream. But there is a perfectly reasonable explanation for the black sand. Iceland is a land of fire and ice. Ice in the cool waves that you see before you, and the icy glaciers peppered across the fine countryside, and fire beneath your feet, and erupting from volcanoes all around. The black sediment on the beach comes from hot lava floating across the beach, then solidifying when it hits 
the cold water. But there is so much life in the alien landscape here. All around you, wild arctic thyme in bloom, sprouting in fireworks of purple and lilac and lavender. They dance in the breeze that glides over you and floats across the sea, carrying petals with them on occasion. It is breathtakingly beautiful, seeing the pop or purple against the black sand and dark ocean. And soon, that is not the only color present. Because, across from you, on yet another island, there is a volcano. It is a small size and a safe distance away, not putting you in any danger, but filling the vista before you with a beautiful display that few people get to see in their lifetimes. Smoke begins to rise out of the volcano, trialing up into the soft blue sky in soft plumes. And soon after, lava begins to spill out of the top of the volcano. It is a mosaic of orange, yellow, and red, so bright that it takes you a moment to truly be able to look at it. It does not come out in an explosion like in the movies. It is slow, gentle almost. When you breathe in, you notice that the lava and smoke stops rising and spilling from the volcano. For that long, nourishing moment, it is as if the volcano isn't erupting at all. But then, when you exhale, it begins to unleash yet again, letting out plumes of smoke like a candle that is freshly blown out. You breathe in, watching as the smoke stops spilling into the air. And then you breathe out just as the volcano, a safe distance away across the sparkling sea, does the same. You breathe in, watching as the smoke and lava stop emerging from the volcano. And you breathe out, admiring the beauty of the glistening lava as it runs down the edge of the volcano. Eventually, the volcano stops entirely, leaving you with a display to simply take in. The remaining lava glides down the edges of the stunning mountain before it sizzles against the cold ocean, leaving a trail black in its wake. It is easy to think of volcanoes as destructive. But soon, the hillside and island that the mountain is on will be blanketed in fresh growth, given new life by the magma beneath the earth. Now that we have taken a moment to find comfort in the place that we are in, here and now, let us begin our story and our journey to the center of the earth. It was May 24th, 1863, and there was a peaceful spring storm 
raging just outside the home of Otto Liedenbrock. A storm that he was too much distracted to pay any mind to. The clouds outside of the window of his home in Hamburg, Germany, were dark and heavy with rain. They were a mosaic of slate gray, of white, of pitch black, so close to the beautiful, lush spring landscape below that it felt as if you could reach out and touch them. They poured a heavy rain over the earth, filling lines in between the cobblestone streets of the quaint city, and flooding gardens on the outskirts. A willow tree, its tendrils heavy with rain, brushed against the large floor-to-ceiling windows of Otto Liedenbrock's home. He was startled for an instant, looking away from the precious item that came into his office. Before he regained his composure, realizing what had just happened, he chuckled to himself and fixed his outfit, taking a sip of tea to help focus himself once more. His office was the office he had always dreamt of. Mahogany wood shelves and panels wrapped around the entire interior. Each shelf was full of delightful treasures and finds, things he had uncovered in his many travels. He was a professor and mineralogist, a man obsessed with and fascinated by the intricacies of the earth and the stones and gems within it. His shelves were lined with minerals he had dug from the earth in distant countries, countries that many people had only read about in books, countries that many people hadn't even heard about. Each gem contained a story, and he was a man that was constantly looking to add more stories to his collection. He took another sip of his Earl Grey tea, letting the fragrance wash over him and soothe him more. The item that he was studying before him was something he had been desperate to get for quite some time. Something he had dreamt about for much too long. It was a runic manuscript from the 12th century. He had spent many hours already trying to decode it. But... As he was trying to decode it, he noticed something rather incredible. There was an addition to the manuscript, something that had been added in the 16th century by Arnie Sagnusum, a renowned Icelandic alchemist. Upon discovering this, Liedenbrock was overcome with joy. He believed that Sagnusum placed the hidden message there in hopes that someone would decode it and learn of a scientific discovery he had made. The only problem was, Liedenbrock was having a great deal of trouble decoding the message. He had spent all afternoon, hunched over his cup of tea in the rain, scribbling ink 
on a piece of paper as he tried to make sense of the message he wanted to decipher. Each promising lead seemed to just turn into a dead end, which is part of the reason why Liedenbrock was so pleased that his nephew, Axel, had come to join him in his research recently. Axel was an enthusiastic, excitable young boy, but a boy that had a bit more sense and reason than his uncle. Liedenbrock had little to no fear, danger, of the unknown. Making discoveries was so fulfilling to him that his own safety did not matter. Axel, on the other hand, was a man who was passionate, but perhaps a bit less eccentric than his uncle. Frustrated, Diedenbrock handed the manuscript to his nephew, hoping that Axel would be able to decipher it. Axel curled up in the window seat of the study, alternating between looking at the manuscript and gazing out into the rain as he chewed over his thoughts. After a few rounds of this, he suddenly saw a pattern in the runes repeat, and, combined with his previous knowledge, it just clicked. He could read the message in its entirety, and what it read made his heart stop. It read very clearly, go down into the crater of Snaifelsgjokut, which Skartus' shadow caresses just before the calends of July, O oh daring traveler and you'll make it to the center of the earth. I've done so. Arni Sagnusum. Axel knew his uncle would want to journey to the center of the earth if he heard the truth behind the message. He feared the journey would be dangerous. No, he knew the journey would be dangerous. And only someone as enthusiastic as his uncle, would be willing to embark on something so epic. Liedenbrock saw the sparkle in Axel's eyes when he decoded the message. He asked Axel what he had read, but Axel lied, averting his gaze from his uncle and telling him he thought he had it but was unable to solve it. However, Liedenbrock knew better. He sat beside his nephew and stared him directly in the eyes. He told Axel that life is about discovery, about learning new things about the world. There is nothing more important or valuable than that. He knew Axel learned something just now, something that he should share. Axel couldn't hold the secret in, no matter how much he feared the journey ahead. He told his uncle what the message read. Liedenbrock was overjoyed. Immediately, he began to gather his belongings to embark on the journey. Axel watched from the chair as his uncle bounded around the room like a child on Christmas, readying himself for the trip. He told Axel to come along as well. At first, the idea sent a shiver down Axel's spine. How could he embark on a journey so dangerous? 
journeys so far into the unknown. He told his uncle he would need to think about it for a bit, looking for the right path, desperate for a right decision. Axel decided to go for a walk in the rain. It was a steady drizzle, the kind that clears your mind, washing away any worries or tangled thoughts, and leaving you clear-headed. The brisk air was invigorating, allowing him much more energy and excitement than the stuffy office offered. He was still unsure if he wanted to go on the journey, and as he laid eyes on his beautiful fiance, Grauben, reading under the gazebo in the garden, he was even more uncertain. He approached her and told her of the ordeal. As he spoke, he couldn't keep his eyes off of her. There was so much beauty in every movement, every blink of her lashes, every curl of her lip, every sigh and glance that escaped her. He was perpetually mesmerized by her, blessed to have her as his future wife. When he finished telling her of the dilemma, he was surprised by Grauben's enthusiastic reply. She told Axel that he should embark on the journey. He should join his uncle and see what discoveries are to be made. She gave him a gentle kiss on the cheek, wishing him well, and telling him that this was, indeed, the right decision to make. Fueled by his fiancée's advice, Axel returned to Lidenrock and told him that he would join him on their excursion to the center of the earth. They set off in early June, leaving Hamburg for Iceland. They disembarked in Reykjavik from a boat and when they saw the land before them, they were breathless. It was a beautiful country, even here in the city. Snow-capped mountains dominated the horizon. They seemed to brush up against the heavens, casting a stunning glow on the landscape far below. In the midst of summer, the usually frozen landscape was awash in a sea of green. There was moss, lichen, grass, wildflowers as far as the eye could see. Axel had never seen so many shades of green before in his life. And then, in the midst of that swirl of emerald, shamrock, pine, and fern, there were brilliant pops of lilac, lavender, and indigo. Wild arctic thyme stretched as far as the eye could see, peppering the landscape in a beautiful haze. Axel was in awe of what lay before him. He had never seen anything this beautiful before. Surely, he had read plenty about this, but no words could describe how breathtaking it was. In Reykjavik, the two worked at finding a guide. Biedenbrock was thrilled to find a guide named Hans, a stoic and calm man with a large build. Hans was incredibly familiar with the wilderness. Of Iceland, and though he had never been in any of the volcanoes, he was not afraid to descend into them. They set off from Reykjavik soon after, 
heading northwest to the Snifelsnes, or Snowfell Peninsula. There, they journeyed through more meadows and beautiful countryside full of mountains and waterfalls. Waterfalls that kicked up a brilliant gossamer that gave the entire landscape an ethereal glow. Finally, they reached the volcanic crater. It looked much like a mountain, with a snow-capped top and beautiful grassy sides that sloped up towards the heavens. They climbed their way to the top of the crater, drinking in the unbelievably fresh air of the wilderness there. When they reached the top, they managed to find a winding slope that led down into the volcano. The exact thing that Liedenbrock had been hoping to find. Slowly, the world around them began to transform. There was no longer ice and snow. They were in a land of stone, with pockets of moss and lichen growing on the rock walls. Some of the plants were incredibly strange, things none of them had ever seen before. The deeper they went, the more prehistoric-looking the plants became. Soon, they reached a crossroads in the path. Using clues from the rock and a hunch of his own, Liedenbrock picked their first path. They followed the path for hours and hours. It grew darker with every step they took, but Liedenbrock especially did not care because on the walls of the path, there were already discoveries to be made. The geology around them was getting older the deeper they went. They were journeying to the prehistoric past following these rocks, something that filled Liedenbrock with joy and excitement unlike any other. This was what his whole career was about. And examples he had been searching for his whole life were laid out in front of him. Axel, on the other hand, was growing more anxious on the journey, unsure if they were going the right way. At the same time, he was driven to by the discoveries they were making. He wondered what else could possibly lie around the next corner. His hopes were dashed when they rounded a corner and discovered a dead end. By then, they were out of water, and the tunnels had begun to spin in Axel's mind because of the dehydration he was feeling. Hans patted Axel on the back, exceedingly calm considering the situation they found themselves in. He promised the young man that he would find him water, no matter what it took. He set off alone, promising to return only once he found water. Fortunately for Axel, it did not take long. Inspecting the walls of the cavern, Alex discovered a spot where water was flowing behind the wall. He gathered Axel and Liedenbrock and brought them to the spot in the wall. At that point, Axel was desperate for water. He could hear it running behind the wall and his whole body ached to drink it. Liedenbrock drilled a hole in the wall, and as he did, a brook sprung forth. The water soaring over the cavern floor 
nearly brought tears to Axel's eyes. The sound of the water radiated off the wall, reminding him of the childhood stream he played in in his youth. He bent on his knees and took a long, wonderful drink of the cold water. Everyone gathered water in their canteens, enough to last them for the rest of their journey. Liedenbrock named the brook after Hans, which brought a smile to Hans's face for the first time on their journey. They continued on, taking the correct path this time. To their delight and astonishment, this path was even more wonderful than the last. The fossils and prehistoric geology along the cavern walls lit a fire in Liedenbrock. He had never seen something this incredible. Indeed, it seemed like his whole career had led to this moment. He traced his hands over the fossils and rocks along the walls, savoring the feeling of them. The unique textures that could only be found in these kinds of specimens. Soon, the narrow path the group was taking began to widen and open up to something else entirely. They walked a bit faster, their bodies buzzing with anticipation, their minds reeling with the possibilities of what could lie before them. Finally, the narrow, dark pathway opened to a cavern, the largest cavern any of them had ever seen in their lives. The ceiling of the cavern was impossibly tall, so tall that it looked as if the night sky was above them. Before them, a large underwater sea stretched as far as the eye could see. The waves lapped the shore, indicating some kind of wind, some kind of motion within the cavern. And, though the underwater sea was thrilling, there was something even more exciting on the shores. Massive mushrooms towered over the explorers. They stood beneath them, looking up at them as if they were umbrellas keeping them out of the rain. The group identified them as giant champignons. Only these were truly, truly giant, much more than the normal ones found on Earth. The walls and floor of the cavern blanketed in different kinds of fungi they couldn't have imagined before. There were prehistoric-looking, bizarre plants sprouting from the earth around them. Axel brushed his hands over them in absolute disbelief that plants that looked like that could even exist. As much as they wanted to stay, and learn about the strange plants here. They knew they had to continue their journey across the sea if they wanted to get to the true center of the earth. Using what was available to them, they gathered petrified wood and crafted a boat that would enable them to sail across the sea. As Axel stepped onto the boat, his heart leapt in his chest. Who knew what lay beyond the safety of the shores of the cavern? Regardless, he gave a nod to his uncle, urging him to kick off the shore. Though Axel was afraid, he felt safer in his uncle's knowledge. And on this journey, 
he truly felt like he was part of something epic. They sailed for quite some time, and as they continued on, their worries began to grow. The sea was rougher than they expected, and also much larger. It felt as though they were sailing over the Black Sea or a great lake, and matters were only made worse when there was a burst of water beside them. There, two ancient creatures were locked in a battle with one another. Two dinosaurs. Everyone was in shock. They had read about them their whole lives, but to see them alive, in action, was something entirely different. Edenbrock managed to shake his shock enough to tell everyone what the creatures were. The ichthyosaur and the plesiosaur. Two creatures that ruled the sea millions of years ago. Not wanting to get in the midst of their fight or be capsized, they sailed on, leaving the strange, wild creatures behind. Now knowing what lay beneath the waves, the group was more desperate to escape. But soon, a massive storm washed upon them. Rain poured down over their boat, and the waves rocked with ferocity. Overhead, thunder crackled. Lightning struck the water all around them, illuminating the cavern in a blinding yellow glow, until finally it struck the boat causing it to burst into flames. The group managed to work together to get the flames out, and, to their relief, they managed to wash ashore. They were thrilled not only to survive, but to make it to the other side of the sea. Only When they looked at their compass, they realized they had not made it to the other side of the sea. They were washed right back to where they started. At first, Lidenbrock was angry and disappointed. But soon, he calmed down. He reminded everyone what they had come for. And that was discovery. They would sail across the waves and move along, just as they had planned. But first, they should take a deeper look at the area. Axel was impressed and frustrated at the same time by his uncle's stubbornness. But that soon faded as they explored the shore and uncovered more incredible findings. They found themselves in a forest from the tertiary period, with incredible foliage and fossils from the early days of planetary life. Peeking out from the lush foliage, thousands of miles beneath the Earth's surface, They were shocked to catch sight of a mastodon wandering through a clearing. And not just that, but a twelve-foot, primeval-looking man, enlightened by this and thrilled by the discovery, they still had enough sense not to get caught. As they turned to continue on, however, they discovered something incredible. A rusted knife next to markings on a rock. Markings that gave the real directions to the center of the earth. 
markings that Sagnusum had left all those years ago. They may have gone backwards, but it was exactly where they needed to be. Fueled by this new information, they pressed onwards, only to find a huge rock in their path. Fueled by excitement and newfound confidence in their journey, Axel suggested they use gum cotton to blow the rock away. They put the explosives at the base of the rock and waited on their new raft. At first, it seemed that the explosion worked. But soon, the realization dawned on them. The power of the explosion caused a disruption with the sea. And before they could run, they were swept up in a massive swell. They tumbled, fighting for their lives as the cold water thrashed them to and fro. They managed to grab hold of each other just as they realized they were moving upward. Heat began to rise around them, and they began to move more quickly. Liedenbrock was not worried. He told everyone that the explosion was taking them back up to the earth. Moments later, their raft tumbled out of a volcano. But they quickly realized that they're no longer on Iceland, but the Mediterranean island of Stromboli, off the north coast of Sicily. The brilliant sun washing over their faces was magical. The island around them was tiny and green, with unique shrubs and migrating birds. Thankful to be alive, they gathered together to eat sweet, sweet berries that they found hidden around them. Soon, local fishermen discovered them, mistaking them for shipwreck survivors. They first took them to their homes to eat and rest. Soon after, they traveled back home to Germany, where an entirely new life awaited them. After sharing their findings, Liedenbrock became famous, spending most of his time giving lectures about his journey. Hans returned home to his peaceful life in Iceland, and Axel married the love of his life, excited to settle down after such a remarkable journey. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, calm sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, Sweet dreams. <laughs>